Welcome to the University of Minnesota China Center's Considering China webinar series. Our webinar today is HIV in China, how the politics and scandal and redress have shaped the epi epidemiological landscape. I was gonna slip on that word. Um, my name is Joan Brzezinski and I'm the director of the China Center. Um, thank you for joining us here today. Your support of the China Center and this webinar series is essential. Your generosity makes programs like this possible. We particularly like to express our thanks to Kai Mei and Joseph Terry for their philanthropic support. We invite you to join us and help us sustain our mission and give to the China Center through the link on your invitation or at our website. At the end of the program, we'll take Q&A um, through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and, uh, We'll have our, our speaker address your questions and as many as, as we possibly can. The speaker today is Kumi Smith, an assistant professor in the Division of Epidemiology and Community Health at the University of Minnesota. Her research and interests focus on HIV and STI prevention in global settings. After a family trip to China, Kumi went on to study Chinese language and culture as a history major at Yale, and she returned to China in 2007 to work with the Clinton Foundation in Beijing in the HI division of the Chinese Center for Disease. She continued to collaborate with Chinese health departments and community groups to conduct epidemiological research during her doctoral training in epidemiology at the University of North Carolina. Her work spans research in the areas of infectious disease, dynamics, social determinants of health and health equity. In addition to China, she's worked in on projects in Vietnam, Malawi, India, and a number of U.S. City settings. Welcome, Professor Smith. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you. Sorry for my muting challenges. Um, thank you so much for this uh, generous opportunity. It's it's a real pleasure to. Um, come and talk to you today about my two favorite topics, which are uh, China and, and HIV. So I will begin sharing some slides, but if there's any problems with, I hope Joan and uh, Haiyan can let me know. So um, as Joan generously shared, this is a, a talk that I'm gonna call how the politics of scandal and redress have shaped the epidemiological landscape. Um, and that's a, that's a mouthful. And so really what I'm going to do instead is really just tell you um, sort of three stories from my experiences working in China on HIV. Um, and I'll, I'll call them acts in, in sort of uh, Ira Glass style. So the first act is what I'll call secret stashes of data. Um, and my story for this starts when I uh, graduated from my master's program in international relations at the University of California, San Diego. And I pursued development studies and East Asian politics as my sort of area of interest. But somewhere along the way, I had also become really interested in public health. And the job I ended up taking was uh, to work inside of the Chinese Center for Disease Control in their uh, HIV epidemiology unit. Um, and even though I'd been studying Chinese language and history since my undergrad days, when it kind of came to China's HIV situation, um, all I really knew about it was uh, as much as I had been able to discern through a um, Chinese language independent study project that I had done uh, during my program. And who, by the way, I did this uh, study with a Taiwanese national was my teacher. And she had some very choice views about the Communist Party <laughs> and their human rights record. So I really didn't know what I was getting into and I didn't know really what to expect. Um, but as I was preparing to move back to China, um, I was noticing that I was hearing two very specific things from friends and family about this job. The first was that they assumed that HIV must be a very, very political disease in China and therefore health authorities must track every single HIV case and um, track their every movement and know everything about them. Uh, the second assumption was that this would generate a massive stash of, of very rich data um, that was likely kept under lock and key. And as a foreigner, we all assume that I would never be allowed anywhere near this data. Um, so with these thoughts in mind, off I went and uh, this I went to my new job at the Chinese Center for uh, HIV STD Control and Prevention, which I'll just call the National Center for AIDS. Um, and this picture is uh, what it looked like when I showed up. Um, so even though I was working for the Chinese government, technically I had been hired by the Clinton Foundation who had a mission of seconding foreigners like me 
to, uh, to the government offices that they're trying to help as a technical capacity building initiative. Um, and so when I reported to my first day of work, I, I already had known that the Clinton Foundation offices were beautiful and they were in like the, you know, the tree lined um, district of the, the, the um, embassy district of the city. But instead it was very striking to me that the, the National Center for AIDS was actually in a much more humble and forgotten part of town near the Temple of Heaven. Um, and what you see here, this building that's very humble is, was actually the nice building the one I was personally working working in, the epidemiology division, was actually in a building across the street um, that was an overflow space because they had already run out of office space. Uh, and the building that I sat in was actually literally designated for demolition by the time I got there. It had like a the chai sign on the on the door, and it meant that anything that was uh, broken in that building stayed broken for, for the whole time that I was there. Um, and just this an aside, but this is what the uh, center for AIDS looks like now. It's one of these uh, buildings on the campus of the CDC. It's a beautiful campus, very state of the art, but impossible to get to. It's actually near the Sixth Ring Road and um, the China CDC has been bleeding staff and uh, hemorrhaging staff because they've, uh, so many people have quit because the commute is so horrible. But anyway, so uh, while I was still in town and I was working for the Department of Epidemiology, um, this is kind of where uh, I was situated. This is an org chart of the uh, National Center for AIDS. And this was a division that uh, was responsible essentially for tracking the HIV epidemic at a national level. And they had a staff of about 10 full-time uh, employees with a number of graduate students. And they were all responsible for confirming every case of HIV that was reported by doctors and hospitals um, and local uh, disease control centers from across China's 1300 some counties. Um, and although there was a web-based case report system um, that was secure and you know, all done on computers, uh, what that actually looked like in practice was quite different in that a lot of doctors were reporting from, they were reporting from very rural areas with poor internet access. Computer literacy was not always as high as uh, they had hoped. And so in practice, this often meant that my colleagues in the division of epidemiology circled in red here, often had to do phone calls or even in-person visits down to their counterparts at the provincial level, the county level, and sometimes even the village level. Um, so there was a lot of uh, really kind of boots on the ground, manual data collection that was happening in order for uh, the National Center for AIDS to really know what their own epidemic really looked like. In addition, these same colleagues in this quite small division were also responsible for conducting um, biannual estimates of, of what the HIV epidemic looked like and for projecting what it would do in the future. Um, the pictures you see here are some examples of the types of uh, figures they would generate for their reports. Uh, and there was much scrutiny of these reports, very, very uh, political uh, monitoring of what, what was concluded in these reports. The colleagues I had also carried out scientific research, and then they also managed the many partnerships that groups like the Clinton Foundation or the World Health Organization or other groups wanted to have with them um, in order to show you know, that they were doing really important work in China. So it was in light of all these responsibilities I saw them shouldering that I found the office environment to be really shockingly under-resourced. Um, specifically, uh, there, there were, um, uh, you know, the CDC couldn't afford the licenses for the statistics packages and the, um, the operating system software in the office computer. So it meant that what everyone did was they turned back the time and date settings on their office computers so that it wouldn't trigger the automatic license renewal notices and it would allow them to keep using, the, using these pirated versions. Um, access to peer review scientific journal articles, as you can imagine, is the bread and butter of, of the science field and uh, no one had subscriptions, the, the center couldn't afford it. So the way that these scientists were getting to uh, articles was to ask you know, people like me or foreign interns to get them through their university subscriptions. Um, and most notably was that staff turnover was really high uh, at the China CDC. And that was because the, the pay schedules were never really updated from the early days of its founding um, and benefits were really scant. Um, and that was not helped by the fact that the best and brightest at the China CDC were regularly poached by the same international organizations that were claiming they were trying to help. Um, so it was really not uncommon for us to go into a meeting and see a former colleague now sitting on the other side of the table 
uh, working for the US CDC or the Clinton Foundation or, or other groups like that. So over the two years that I ended up working at the National Center for AIDS and then the five years that I would then continue to work with them uh, during my doctoral research, um, a few things became kind of obvious to me. Uh, and the first was that there was in fact uh, no stash of uh, data, this you know, golden chest, it didn't exist. Instead, it was a database that was barely held together by the very human efforts of a very small but mighty and underfunded department who was doing the best with what they had. Um, and more specifically, I came to know well the people who are responsible for collecting and collating and validating this data. And that's how I really came to understand just how healthy of skepticism they had about the reliability of this data. Um, and that might make you pause and say, well, that's troubling that the, you know, the very people who collect China's HIV data are skeptical of it. But if you talk to any seasoned epidemiologist, I think you would find that we would all find that to be a very healthy attitude. Um, anyone who's ever conducted primary data collection in the field um, knows that there are so many just everyday real world challenges to um, collecting reliable and representative data. And if you talk to anyone who's, who's working on their own data, you're likely talking to someone who's very skittish about saying anything very definitive uh, with that information. So skepticism does not necessarily equate with uh, fundamentally problematic data. I think it means there's some integrity to the data collection process uh, and a healthy sort of scientific inquiry that's also going on. Second, um, to my earlier point about whether or not I'd be allowed near the data, the answer was in fact, yes. Um, and it wasn't because I got some kind of special approval from high up authorities, um, but rather it was because as you can imagine, we had you know, worked together for two years and, and trust had been established, but it wasn't just generic trust. It was a very specific kind of trust. And that was that um, it was understood that whatever I would analyze and conclude using China CDC data um, would be first sort of run by my colleagues and we would have a chance to discuss what I found um, and to kind of see if we all agreed on, on what I was saying. And this may seem like a little bit of uh, message control, but uh, again, this is something that we would probably find quite normal in the public health world. Um, I can attest to the fact that many of our colleagues at the Minnesota Department of Health um, have actually understandably had times when they've hesitated to hand over their data to academics at the University of Minnesota because they've had bad experiences where a paper that a, um, uh, an academic had written was published without their knowledge and soon they found themselves having to deal with a barrage of questions and demands from the public and the press um, over conclusions that were drawn without their knowledge or you know, without their input. Um, and then finally, the last lesson I learned was that although my friends were wrong about whether or not there was a secret stash of data, they were right that HIV is indeed a very political disease. And there's a long list of dramatic feuds among scientists and policymakers over HIV that prove that. Um, but what I wouldn't have known unless I had gone there myself was that just because something's politically salient to the Communist Party, the CCP, it doesn't automatically mean that that's gonna get you a vast infusion of massive resources to address the problem. Um, as I'll talk about next, uh, there was a, uh, it, a crisis in public health triggered by HIV and later by SARS that did a lot to give the, a wake up call. Oh, excuse me. Uh, there we go. It did give a wake up call to the CCP to invest in public health. Um, but while they did update their uh, infrastructure, it didn't necessarily mean that they provided the resources or tools to the people working on these issues to get these jobs done. So act two um, is the bloodhead scandal. And to explain what that even is, um, some of you have probably heard of it, um, but for those of you who haven't, um, I can first kind of pan out a little bit and explain that there are several types of HIV epidemics. Um, so outside of certain parts of Sub-Saharan Africa where HIV is said to be um, circulated in the, circulating in the so-called general population, and by general population, we mean folks who don't necessarily engage um, in sort of higher risk uh, behaviors associated with HIV transmission. Outside of places like that with generalized epidemics, um, places like China are said to have by what are called in contrast, concentrated epidemics. Um, and a concentrated epidemic is where HIV disproportionately affects who are called uh, key populations. Um, who are sort of considered distinct from the general population. Um, and a key population uh, 
for HIV are typically the three that are listed here. Um, that is men who have sex with men, people who inject drugs, uh, and commercial sex workers. But China is unique for having um, a fourth key population. Um, and those are the people who were infected through mass blood plasma selling scandals in the 1990s. Um, this, was a, this was a mass HIV transmission um, situation that affected mostly poor rural farmers uh, who were selling whole blood or plasma um, to supplement their meager incomes. And this is a picture uh, taken at the time of them uh, lining up um, to, to um, have that chance to sell their blood and, and to make some extra money. Um, but there was very poor regulation, which meant that there were unhygienic practices um, being used everywhere. And the most egregious of these was um, the centrifuging of red blood cells from multiple donors of the same blood type in a common tank, uh, after which those red blood cells were then re-injected back into the donors. Um, and this was done to prevent anemia and allow for more pre frequent donations, but understandably led to the mass uh, transmission and spread of all kinds of bloodborne diseases, most notably HIV and also hepatitis C. Um, rampant corruption meant that the authorities who were charged with regulating these industries were often paid to look the other way. Um, and the consequences were truly disastrous. Um, estimates of the number of people infected through these practices ranged from 50,000 people to maybe three times that. Um, and by the time the government really cracked down on these practices in the late 1990s, um, there were untold numbers had died. This is a picture of a funeral procession for a recently deceased AIDS patient. Um, and in the background, you'll notice many fresh graves of other such victims. Um, so this aspect of China's HIV epidemic is, is quite unique uh, in, in the world of uh, HIV, of global HIV. Um, but an interesting thing to emerge from this was the fact that China now had a fourth key population group um, and uh, one that not many other places really kind of could compare to. Um, and unlike the other key populations that have been affected in China starting in the late 80s, um, and again, those are the men who have sex with men, people who inject drugs and commercial sex workers, these were now poor farmers who weren't engaging in behaviors that were widely considered to be either illegal or uh, socially taboo. Um, in fact, their image as, you know, a very sort of morally pure population was one of the reasons why places like Hunan were targeted for blood donations because their blood was seen as, as pure. Um, and so in this case, national scandals uh, in which now the rural poor are perceived to be dying at the hands of the government uh, is obviously not a good look for any government, um, but was also a potentially very destabilizing uh, narrative for the credibility of the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP. Um, and that's related to a phenomenon that folks uh, surely on this call who are more knowledgeable than me about you know, Chinese political history would know. Maintaining civil order in the countryside is one of the key survival tactics for the CCP, um, who's well aware that the historic dynastic cycles of China have time and again been triggered by social unrest originating in the countryside. Um, and the politicization of AIDS in China has had the hallmarks of modern rural protests, which have always, rural protests has always been a, a matter of close scrutiny um, among political scientists. Um, and those kind of hallmarks of modern rural protest that manifested in the AIDS epidemic was the fact that local agitators were met, were met with local resistance, which was not unusual. But when they were encountering this resistance, they did certain things, for example, take their petitions to the international media as a sort of alternative route, um, or they would also sometimes bypass regional authorities and go straight to the leadership in Beijing. Um, and this was the case with two very famous AIDS activists in China, who some folks on this call may know. Um, the first was uh, Gao Yaojie on the left, who was an OBGYN, who in her retirement began visiting these AIDS villages to treat patients and take care of AIDS orphans who are pictured here with her. Um, and her account of what she learned on the ground through these activities is well documented in several New York Times articles that uh, broke the story internationally. Uh, and the second person is a um, Guixian, an infectious disease doctor from Wuhan on the right, who ran covert epidemiologic studies that confirmed the high HIV rates among the patients that he was treating uh, sort of in secret um, in Hunan. He reported some of what he found in a direct letter to Vice Premier um, Li Lanqing, who famously 
is said to have indicated his acknowledgement of the crisis uh, in a note that he jotted in the margins of Guixian's letter. Um, this is just a fangirl moment that um, Guixian is actually good friends with my former mentor at the University of North Carolina. And I was so excited when I had a chance to meet him in 2013. Um, so one good thing to come out of the crisis in Hunan was that it built political consensus within the top ranks of the uh, Communist Party, the CCP. And this was um, a, really because it was a potential crisis of party credibility. And that led to the establishment of a nationwide free uh, anti-retroviral treatment program, just basically an HIV treatment program for anyone infected with HIV, regardless of how they had gotten infected. And the earliest beneficiaries of this program were naturally the former blood plasma sellers, whose data is shown here in this graph. And you can see it, it had a really impressive rollout, the program. Um, the dotted line shows the, the kind of the rate of the rollout and how much coverage was happening. And uh, this had an immediate impact on mortality rates, which you can see in the solid line starting to decline quite quickly. Um, more recent updates on the treatment outcomes in this specific populations uh, was the subject of my dissertation in 2014. So the takeaway lessons I took from the Hunan tragedy were first that um, the rural poor were a very politically salient group in the Chinese historic context. Um, they're not the most empowered group, um, but they do have a, a, a place of significance in sort of political dynamics and dynastic turnover in China. And the political writing was on the wall enough for the CCP to build consensus within the top ranks. And this swiftly mobilized central policy. It didn't hurt that the SARS outbreak in 2003 was also a very big embarrassment for China's public health credibility, which then infused even more motivation into responding to the HIV crisis um, with determination. Um, second, the fact that the scandal affected poor farmers is actually very central. This is a, a group that um, not only um, forced the party to um, take decisive action um, by disciplining their party and meeting out punishments and changing policy, um, but they also found that the rural poor were providing a safe pathway to launch a much needed publicly funded program. Um, and what I mean by that is HIV is a disease of poverty um, so from a public health point of view, free treatment is a very sensible uh, approach, but it can be politically very hard to sell because it essentially means you're helping people and paying for the treatment of people who um, society does not ever look kindly on, which are gay men, sex workers, and people who are injecting drugs. Um, it was, it's very difficult to imagine uh, such a program that could have been launched on behalf of those marginalized groups. And so the fact that rural farmers became sort of the most uh, visible victims of the HIV epidemic um, actually provided a, a pathway for the creation of one of the most progressive treatment programs we've seen uh, globally. Uh, the US by contrast, for example, does not have anything quite so um, universal, but I think the comparison of the US healthcare system with others has become a, a little bit of a, a tired comparison of lamenting our current state. So the last act um, I'll call manufactured stigma. Um, and this is really a conversation about HIV stigma um, and the fact that HIV is a very highly stigmatized disease. Um, throughout the epidemic until now, we've had, uh, we've been hearing uh, nonstop the terrible accounts of the poor care quality uh, that many AIDS patients in China face, sometimes even resulting in refusal of care. Um, this is of course not unique to China, but I'll argue that features of the Chinese free treatment program for AIDS patients um, may have facilitated and even amplified the stigma that they experience. Um, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So this is a schematic of uh, how the Chinese Ministry of Health is organized. And you can kind of see that it's divided roughly into two sections. On the left, the larger chunk of, uh, of divisions there belong to the public health system. And then on the right is a single column that's described as the medical services system. And you can see that the two systems are quite administratively separate um, and they do have a little bit of communication but their responsibilities are considered distinct. Uh, when the free HIV treatment program was established in 2002, um, because HIV received such special political attention and was elevated to such a special status, uh, the CDC was tasked with running the dispensation of 
HIV drugs through the medical service system. Um, so this was where one half of the um, Ministry of Health was responsible for the procurement and the dispensation of these drugs, but they were doing so through the mechanism of the other half. Um, and it's very unique and rather unusual. In practice, what this meant was that certain hospitals were, the, uh, were designated by the CDC as AIDS treatment centers. Um, this is most common, the most common candidates for this were usually infectious disease hospitals. And the, those hospitals were outfitted to be able to kind of track uh, AIDS patients, to track and monitor their, uh, their drugs, um, to monitor their, their lab measures. Um, and the doctors there also receive special training in AIDS uh, patient, patient care and management. Um, and the result was that China actually there, therefore ended up with a relatively specialized healthcare program for people living with HIV. Um, and in a day-to-day -day sense, what this meant for AIDS patients was that when they were inside the designated AIDS treatment centers, things went relatively well for them. China's ART program, its antiretroviral therapy program, um, has had pretty good marks for um, consistency um, and for reducing mortality. Um, but the problem was that the minute these AIDS patients strayed outside of this network of designated AIDS care centers, they would experience terrible um, stigma. And this manifested in the form of being often, it was in the form of being given the runaround, being told, you know, you can't be treated here because we just don't know how to deal with HIV patients or we can't accommodate that kind of issue. Um, and they would often be referred elsewhere. Most commonly, actually, they were being referred back to the same infectious disease hospital, which was their primary treatment center uh, and where, from which they had been referred. Um, and this would happen even when there was life-threatening emergency care needed. Um, so it was very distressing to hear. Um, so most research on healthcare stigma that uh, people living with HIV face presumes that it's the disease that's being feared and that, you know, it's just that many doctors are ignorant about HIV and that's why the stigma happens. Um, but we've talked to doctors both inside and outside these designated AIDS treatment program centers. And we've learned that the program, while successful, has kind of inadvertently created a vicious cycle where um, doctors who are not part of this AIDS mm -hmm. treatment program often end up with very little exposure to patients with HIV. And so they never end up getting the experience they need to improve their confidence in treating these types of patients. And since the National HIV Treatment Program is so famous, it also gives those same doctors the impression that, well, you know, if I don't care for this patient, I'm sure the government will ultimately, you know, figure things out and, and help them out. Um, so stigma is a really huge problem, but, you know, one of the biggest challenges on how to fix it is that we really actually don't have an easy way to measure it. Um, and this is especially complicated because in the case of HIV, many HIV patients also have other stigmatized identities that make it difficult for us to disentangle if the problems that they're facing are because they're being treated poorly on account of their HIV or maybe because of something else. Um, for example, if, if there's evidence that they inject drugs, that they have same-sex behaviors, that they engage in commercial sex or anything else considered socially taboo. Oops. So um, I'll just share with you um, as a kind of final uh, send off um, a, a research project that we have started to look at stigma um, that I think is uh, sort of a byproduct of the, of the um, very impressive um, but very unique uh, Chinese free treatment program design. So this is a program that my team and I have been working on in Guangzhou um, using what we call a standardized patient approach. So standardized patients um, are commonly known or probably more commonly known as a tool for training med students, as you see here in this picture, um, where uh, the, the woman in the white coat is uh, probably, presumably the trainee and uh, the patient sitting on, um, on the bench there is, is uh, presumably a standardized patient who's a professional trained to sort of go through case scenarios with trainees. Uh, and then there's a, a presumably an educator outside observing this dynamic and is gonna probably take part in the feedback session after. Um, so, but the standardized patient approach is actually being used more and more commonly now, not just for education, but also for conducting what are called incognito 
or unannounced visits. So it's basically kind of like sending patients to a doctor as secret shoppers. And this allows them to observe what clinical behaviors look like when the provider does not know they're being observed. And this is to overcome a, a very well-established uh, concept known as the Hawthorne effect, which is um, the effect that uh, doctors do change their behaviors when they know that they're under observation. So what we have done um, is to partner with the local LGBT community of Guangzhou with whom we've worked for a long time. And specifically we're partnering with um, any, the group that kind of really uh, identifies as men who have sex with men. Um, and this is so that we can look at not only how HIV stigma affects uh, their community, but also how homophobia affects their healthcare experiences. Um, and so this is our amazing team at a recent training that we did. Um, and they'll undergo rigorous training basically to learn how to present very specific cases to doctors. And on top of that, they also memorize about 50, 50 or so specific aspects of that uh, provider encounter, which they then have to memorize and report back to us afterwards. We then use the information that they uh, report to calculate uh, a sort of a care quality score to, to sort of give us a summary of how did that visit go, how were they treated, and what was the quality of clinical care they received. So the, our, our SPs, the um, standardized patients, go to ac uh, actual clinics. And in our case, we're interested in um, looking at the quality of sexual health care. So we send our SPs to STD clinics. And that's where they present, in our case, a presumed case of uh, early syphilis infection. And the thing that we are doing to really try to get at this question of you know, how much of, of um, the experience that they may have is attributable to stigma is that we randomly vary each time an SP goes to a clinic, we randomly vary whether they present as someone who reports same-sex behaviors or who reports having HIV or both or neither. And because the patient, because the visits are standardized in every other way, it allows us to compare the average quality of care received across each of these case scenarios. And um, our sort of hypothesis is that the difference between these different case scenarios could be thought of as the erosion of care quality due to stigma towards either of those attributes or both attributes at the same time. And when I say attributes, I mean uh, HIV infection or um, uh, same-sex behaviors. And so here's a sort of a picture of, of uh, some of these visits in action. Uh, some of our SPs in consultation with doctors. These are um, taken from our pilot study, so these are not um, actual study subjects. Um, the ultimate goal for us is therefore uh, to collect not only more objective data, but also data that's much richer and lets us you know, both quantify the impact of stigma, um, but also characterize the specific ways in which it unfolds. We really want to describe the nature of stigma, not just is it there, yes, no. Um, and we will then be using this information to design a more tailored training program for doctors um, that give them the knowledge and skills they need to provide better care for all of their patients. Uh, and one way that our data can help us do that is by giving us more insights into exactly what may be the drivers of stigma so that we can better address them. And a quick example I can share of the types of things that we've learned in our pilot study is um, that for example, there have been situations when um, we've actually observed really positive behaviors um, on the part of doctors. In one case, our SP presented as an HIV positive patient and the provider actually thanked him saying, you know, thank you for sharing your HIV status with me, it's very helpful. So this was a, a case where we learned that actually there was a lot of doctors out there who are already exhibiting really positive behaviors and that perhaps we could be using peer-to-peer -peer education as a way to improve the overall quality of care. Um, a second example of something we learned during our pilot work uh, was that there's certain situations in which the clinic environment itself is actually the problem. Um, so there was uh, another SP who um, presented as an HIV positive patient and found that um, the, the door was left wide open and his whole consultation could be heard by other people. Um, and as he was leaving, he overheard some of the uh, provider's colleagues uh, warning other patients not to go into that room because an HIV patient had just been in there. So this is a, a case where we see that, um, of course, in addition to sort of stigma reduction training for the staff, um, 
just sort of introducing some basic uh, privacy uh, protocols um, to ensure patient privacy, not just for HIV patients, but for all patients, um, could do a lot to really improve outcomes for, um, for patients who are uh, living in, with stigmatized and marginalized identities. So we're re really at the end of our sort of baseline data collection. Um, and I'm hoping that um, if you check back with me in about a year and a half, <laughs> we'll have results of how effective our uh, trainings were, as well as um, um, some conclusive evidence of, or conclusive data about how much care quality suffers for Chinese um, patients, either in the presence of stigma, uh, HIV stigma or homophobia. So my final thoughts uh, that I can share are that, um, you know, the politics have definitely shaped HIV research in China. This is a disease that primarily affects those marginalized for things like sexual and drug use practices. And so it's always going to be a political disease. And um, this has been no exception in China. But the specific ways in which something gets politicized and the reasons for why it got politicized do require always a better understanding of the local context. Um, and so that's what I'm hoping I have imparted a bit with the story of um, how HIV specifically became sort of a politicized topic in China. Uh, I think an obvious parallel when we think about how um, politics can kind of shape uh, or how, how um, public health issues can be shaped by politics is uh, when I think of the mask wearing in the US during COVID. I've had some Chinese friends ask me, you know, why are Americans so opposed to wearing masks? And when I think of all the things I'd have to think about and explain and all the history I'd need to get into, I generally respond well, like, how much time do you have to talk about this topic? Um, so we're sadly in a time when we can really reflect on this in a, in a more sort of personal way. Um, another issue is that public health, much like with things like infrastructure or security, it's a, it's a sector that doesn't tend to inspire massive interest or advocacy from the wider public. Um, and that is to say that when disaster strikes um, and people grow incensed at these failures, that is when we tend to see movement. So disaster is extremely useful for mobilizing political consensus and policy change. Um, but for fields like public health where our goals are very long-term and progress is very slow moving, uh, one of the biggest challenges with this is that we need sustainability and sustained interest and sustained investment. Um, and sadly, those things in public health uh, tend to be more elusive and lock us into what has been described of cycles of panic and neglect. Um, and in closing, I'll just take the opportunity to be speaking with an audience that's uh, maybe more interested in China or tuned into China um, to make an appeal that um, I think joint scholarship between the US and China is more important than ever. Um, I'm an American academic doing research in China and I will tell you that the increased reporting burdens um, and the oversight that has to be uh, put on my projects um, has definitely created burdens and, and a lot of nervousness uh, in our team, especially among our um, Chinese counterparts who are themselves experiencing added scrutiny as well. Um, and there's an appropriate, you know, this is an appropriate response because there have been known cases of intellectual property theft and espionage that has happened through um, academic uh, partnerships. But it does mean that I've had some more senior uh, mentors um, who have actually sometimes tried to steer me away from China-based research, saying, you know, this is very risky. It might not be the best thing for your career. Um, and I, I do find that to be a very um, disconcerting direction for our kind of mental <laughs> uh, projection towards collaborative research in China to be heading. Um, I do acknowledge that there is evidence of early data cover-ups, not only with the COVID, uh, early COVID outbreak in Wuhan, but also with HIV in the past. Um, but what I want to remind ourselves, including myself, is that we shouldn't take incidents like that to conflate what Chinese scientists and doctors were doing and thinking with what policymakers ultimately decided to do and think. Um, and the direct connections between scientific colleagues across national lines can really provide important track to dialogue channels um, that can be really important for transmitting information when, um, when talks at the top level shut down or, if, or for acting as a valve to release pressure when tensions rise. Um, so I do hope that if there's any folks listening who are 
interested in research in China or who are interested in pursuing uh, Chinese studies that, um, that we all work together to try to keep these um, collaborations going um, and to, to foster more relationships like what the China Center uh, here at the University of Minnesota is doing. So um, that is it for me and I'm, I'm happy to um, take any questions. Thank you for all your time. Thank you, Kumi. This was fantastic. And I do appreciate your closing um, comments and advice as far as um, continuing our research collaborations and continuing to build these relationships academically and professionally. I think that's so important to what we have as um, a, a shared um, experience here. So we'll take a couple of questions. Um, what do you think the non-transparency to the epidemic disaster, including HIV, COVID, will influence um, in terms of the future of the CCP? Well, I think um, to assume that the CCP is a monolithic body that has one opinion about, about data cover-ups is probably our first um, naive kind of mistake. Um, there's a lot of tensions within different factions of the CCP. There's been um, people far more uh, qualified than me speaking in earlier China Center talks that I definitely encourage viewers to check out. Um, that can really show you where the tensions are. Um, and I think a lot of the decisions that um, uh, motivate whether or not data cover-ups happen have a lot to do with um, the, the conversations that we witnessed early in our COVID outbreak. And you can kind of um, just appreciate that at least in, in this situation of the US, they were just out in the open. Um, and I would say that from my kind of very far away understanding, it really is the tension between um, the, the, those who are feel that they are the safeguards, safeguarders of the economy um, versus those that feel that they're trying to se secure the, um, the health and security of the nation. And those tensions are obviously dynamic um, and shaped by context. So I think those things that um, we saw out in the open here were happening also on the ground in China. Um, it's just that we're gonna be learning about it much, much later and probably through um, less conventional channels. Um, do you agree or do you believe that the COVID-19 um, is a lab accident? I have read a number of papers um, that rely on phylogenetic analyses um, that really try to trace where the virus um, comes from using sort of basically uh, evolutionary biology. Um, and I find that line of uh, reasoning to be relatively uh, sound. And so based on that, I, I don't believe that it is uh, out of a lab. Okay. Um, well, I'd like to thank you. And I'm going to invite our um, Associate Vice President and Dean Meredith to say a few words. She's on mute. There she is. Yep. Sorry. Some, I, I love it when somebody's able to mute me. That would be many people's dream. Um, Dr. Smith, thank you so much. I have a couple of questions first before I wrap this up. Um, is that I, the, the um, stigma study that you were a part of or helped create, is that, is that relatively unique? I've never heard of anything like it. I too was um, having <laughs> muting challenges. Um, yeah, thanks for your question. Um, it's, it's a unique merging of two different fields. One field that uses this are people who study health service delivery and healthcare quality, um, which is something a little bit further from me. Um, and what they have always done is to use this as a way to just monitor uh, how healthcare systems are doing. It's very popular for use in low middle income countries where direct sort of um, monitoring uh, and reporting is a little bit more challenging. Uh, and then what's happened in our case is that I put my head together with um, a fellow China hand who's a um, health economist. And I was like, hey, you know, we're actually always concerned about stigma and we really stink at measuring it. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, doctors, if we ask doctors, do you stigmatize patients? They're not gonna yeah. necessarily be all that motivated to say yes. Um, and if you ask patients, you'll get a pretty good response from them, there's no necessary reason to question their, um, the veracity of what they're saying, but it's, it's not very standardized. Each mm -hmm. patient has a very complicated patient history, and there may be a lot of context that shapes the experience that they had that we can't really control for. Um, so the standardized patient project was a way of 
me lamenting about stigma measurement and how we all say it's so important and yet we really don't know how to measure it. And then uh, my health economist friend saying, you know, we monitor healthcare systems, but really like what is, what's the, what's the end game? And so this was kind of emerging and we actually, we call it um, our nerdy name for this approach is a experimental audit <laughs> mm -hmm. um, approach. And based on where our funding is coming from the National Institutes of Health in the US. Um, and they've told us that they, they've never kind of seen anything like this. Um, so we're, we're trying, we're preparing to present our initial results as if it's new to the world, but um, mm -hmm. we'll find out if it, if there might be other groups who've already thought of this as well. Yeah, it's really, really a amazing concept. I, I, I admire the men that have um, agreed to be that and to memorize all those um, characteristics and report. I think it's fascinating. So, and just out of curiosity, how well do the various CDC units work across borders? Is it pretty collegial? Is it pretty competitive? Is it, I'm just kind of curious. Do you mean uh, provincial borders? You know, I mean like the Chinese CDC and the American CDC and the, is that all, do they all sort of set out, you know, is there a agreed protocol or are they in somewhat of a competition to prove they're making more progress in one place or another? Maybe my question um, isn't clear. Stop me if I'm misunderstanding your question, but um, my understanding is that the China CDC was modeled directly off of the US CDC. So there was a more so, sort of a scientific researchy type of uh, organization that got reborn as the as the China CDC later on. So I think the relationship has always been one of mentorship. Um, and, you know, I think now moving forward, the idea is to try to um, balance that relationship into more of an equal um, partnership. Uh, but yeah, I don't I don't know of um, China CDC offices in say Atlanta, but I do know that the US CDC does have a, an office in China. Um, although when I was there, that was a very bustling office, lots of employees. And I, I think it's down to maybe three people now. And that's, I think, partly a reflection of um, maybe some political climate, but also just China is, is really moving into middle income country status and, and not considered as much of a priority for these programs. You're muted again, aren't you? I know. <laughs> <laughs> what they always want. Um, uh, so first of all, I want to start off by thanking the China Center because, um, Dr. Smith, you are you you may know this, but you're part of a series that we've had, and I think this is the last one for the academic year. But it's just been this really great combination of opportunities to um, learn different things about China. And of course, your um, your presentation is as much about public health as it is about China. But for those of us who have been um, just rewarded by attending these every time and learning more about the country, I want to thank you for your contribution. Um, it, it's just so interesting. First of all, it's nice to uh, interesting to talk about something that isn't COVID. So that's a nice break. Uh, and just to learn about uh, the different approach, as I've already mentioned, to your um, particularly the stigma study. I think it's important that all of us are, you know, are aware of other settings and circumstances and responses to shared experiences. So just the way you opened the conversation about what people thought would be the approach or the attitude of, of the Chinese Communist Party or the standard Chinese citizen towards an HIV AIDS person, um, it, it, you know, you just shed a whole new light on it. And I think it just helps all of us appreciate more about the culture. Uh, and also just to um, break down some of the stereotypes that I think Americans are pretty quick to jump to uh, when thinking about China. Um, and I really wanna thank you for your comment about joint scholarship. Um, there, we need scientists like you, we need, we need Chinese American scientists, we need Chinese scientists, we need people to share uh, what they learn so that we can all become just wiser and healthier. Uh, and it, it, it can't be said too often so I admire your, your commitment. And I, I, I think it's particularly interesting that you know, your supportive mentors, people that you trust who believe in your work, who are suggesting that you do something else for a while are doing it out of, you know, for all good reasons, but it, it's, it's just contrary to what we need to do to um, solve some of these huge challenges. So thank you for being so, um, so clear and so smart <laughs> and for giving your time to us uh, today because I think we just all learned a lot. So appreciate it.
Well, thank you and Meredith and thank you, Dr. Smith. And we will conclude our, our visit with everyone here today and enjoy your summer. We'll be back in the fall. Thank you all.